the brain listens to the lungs. Uh -huh. Okay, so breathing and emotion, in terms of neurologically, are very tightly connected, and the pathways are very rapid. today with Drs. Patricia Gerbach and Richard Brown. Uh, Patricia and Richard are a husband and wife team from the States. Um, Dr. Gerbach is the Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at New York Medical College and Dr. Brown is the Associate Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at Columbia University. Um, they study integrative medicine with a really specific interest in breathing, so they take uh, yogic breathing, traditional qigong breathing techniques, and they take a scientific lens to them and study what's working, what isn't, how how does this work, what, what health benefits might there be. And between them, they've authored over 40 uh, peer-reviewed research papers and award-winning medical books and chapters in other people's books. And uh, such is the, their belief in the power of breathing as a healing tool. Um, but they, for the last 15 years, they've travelled to disaster relief zones all around the world, uh, working with victims of the 9-11 attacks and um, travelling to the Haitian earthquake in 2010, and most recently working with survivors of slavery in South Sudan. And uh, they're here today to hopefully expound on some of the ideas in their newest book, The Healing Power of the Breath. So guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Thanks for having us. So two very intelligent and sensible uh, doctors and uh, researchers, and both with very uh, interesting backgrounds from Harvard and Cornell. How do you find yourself in this uh, almost esoteric world of Eastern medicine? Well, for me, I was interested in herbs and yoga and Buddhism from an early age. So, um, but my getting into the breathing was helped by being attacked when I was in fifth and sixth grade by gangs of neo-Nazi white supremacists. And I was saved by an older boy who knew martial arts. And I realized I couldn't always assume he would be around to save me. And I then, where I live, there were many different martial arts. And I interviewed different teachers and began training with a teacher and he was uh, quite spiritual and required breathing and meditation mm. as well as yoga i had already started yoga when i was nine uh, and had been doing reading about yoga and buddhism and hinduism as well as other religions mm. and uh, so as i progressed i found that the breathing was very important and it wasn't uh, in the japanese tradition you really don't talk much. There's no theology or philosophy that really, it's just a way, a way of practice. But I could see the difference it made for me and the difference it made for other people. Then some years later, when I went to medical school at Columbia in the northern end of Manhattan, it was the height of the crack epidemic. Mm. And we had, uh, we would vie with a precinct in the Bronx for the most crack related murders. Wow. And many of my friends were mugged, some were stabbed, one was shot and killed with three children. And I said, it's time to do the most serious form of martial art that I know. Although I was still doing judo and jiu-jitsu, and that was great and had been so good for me growing up. Mm -hmm. But I began to do a style of Japanese karate uh, that was very, very hard. And it was required when you were more than just a beginner to do breathing and meditation. Uh, very traditional Zen, Soto Zen. Uh, not Rizai Zen, which is kind of what's best known about in the West. Um, and as time went on, I also realized uh, I was very interested in alternative ways of healing than just conventional ways. I was interested in mm. all the conventional ways, and I'm very glad we have all kinds of advanced Western medicine. Mm. But in psychiatry that I was doing, things were going more and more toward kind of shifting away from talking to patients and understanding patients 
to giving them primarily medicines. Mm. There are other biological treatments, and I'm, I'm a biological psychiatrist, I'm a psychopharmacologist, but I felt the majority of people actually would benefit from knowing breathing and meditation and also movement. And over the course of my lifetime, it feels like people are moving less and less, and they need to be moving more, and they need to be getting more in touch with their authentic original self. And um, so after I'd established myself as a psychiatrist, I wanted to begin to tell people about another way of doing things. So my father's father was a master mushroom healer. So I grew up knowing that herbs were very good to heal people from all kinds of things. Mm, wow. And I couldn't talk about that in medical school. So, and, it's, uh, so just to interrupt you, a master mushroom healer, what, yeah. what, what does that that's well, you can study? he knew, I mean, it was an ancient art from, from Germany and Eastern Europe. Mm. It's also an art in Japan and China as well, using medicinal mushrooms. Not just using mushrooms to kind of be a tonic, mm. but using different mushrooms to heal different things. Wow. And so I, I early on had the idea that, because he would take me to his mushroom clinic, <laughs> and I would see people coming back and getting better from being given different mushrooms. Wow. And then my sister lived in Wyoming, and we got to go onto the reservation. She was friends with people from the res Indian reservation and who had grown up there. And I saw shamans healing with very different tools <laughs> than Western doctors use. Mm. And the, for my first Judah teacher was also, uh, he was from Cuba. And he was very familiar with Central American and South American healing. And so that was all part of what I was exposed to, including acupuncture and things like that. So I had to not talk about those things in medical school. Uh, but at a certain point, I felt that with a worldwide epidemic of depression, anxiety, stress, aggression, PTSD, people needed to take more responsibility for themselves and not just wait for a, a medical system to do things to them mm. to make them better. Mm. Although that can be helpful mm. at the right time. Uh, and at that point, I wrote a book about uh, a more natural approach using Zen and yoga and certain herbs and nutrients for depression. And uh, about a year after that, uh, a yoga foundation that's worldwide, but based in India, contacted me to do a presentation with other people at the United Nations about a more affordable alternative than just giving medicine, because much of the world can't afford Western medicine. And there's an epidemic of this, or these problems all over the world. Mm. So that led, led to my uh, getting more familiar with yoga breathing techniques, becoming a teacher, traveling with a famous guru from India. I already had an Aikido master, a Japanese Aikido master, who introduced me to what's now the foundational core breathing of what we teach. But we only did it for short periods. He does it much longer. Mm, but okay. for the students, he would offer it, and then it was up to them to do with it what they were going to do. And uh, so all these threads came together, and... Uh, and then I introduced Pat uh, to those things. So I had a rather different background uh, compared with my husband. Uh, I grew up in a rural area of the Hudson Valley, literally in the middle of cornfields. And my dad was a doctor. So uh, we knew what that life was like. He loved his work. Um, he used to make house calls. And quality time was when you got to go in the car with him on a house call. So I really got to see a certain uh, way of practicing medicine, a devotion to the field. Mm. And also he would talk to me about the importance of his patients' emotions mm. in their medical issues. Uh, so I think he was a wonderful role model and he really encouraged me to go to medical school. But uh, he practiced conventional medicine, although he was always looking for new things. It was standard treatment. And I had a very classical medical training, you know, Harvard Medical School, all through my training residency. And I, you know, Boston Psychoanalytic Institute, I mean, you can't get more traditional than mm. that. So when I 
was aware my husband was doing lots of non-conventional things, you know, I said, oh, that's, that's great, sweetie, you do your thing, you know, I'm happy in my office doing my psychotherapy, and <laughs> yeah. you do your thing, I do my... And then um, I became very ill in the 1990s with Lyme disease, which, as you know, is transmitted by ticks, and uh, we live, living in a fairly rural area, there are a lot of deer ticks and things like that, and this illness went on for many years before it was diagnosed, and I was really quite impaired. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was keeping me going with non-traditional herbs and nutrients because the traditional doctors were not being successful. And eventually, even when I was treated with antibiotics, um, my nervous system didn't really recover. They eradicated the infection, but the damage to certain areas of my brain was still there. Mm -hmm. I had no memory. I was really barely functioning. Mm -hmm. And then he began bringing home certain herbs that literally um, enabled my brain to heal itself. So that was the point where, finally, my mind opened to other possibilities. And we find this a lot, that it's often uh, doctors who either themselves or someone they loved has had a really serious condition that could not be cured by standard medicine. And in desperation, <laughs> they look into alternative treatments. Mm. And that's how a lot of us come to the field. So I understand the skepticism of my colleagues very mm. well. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Dick became interested in breathing practices. And he persuaded me that doing them would improve my energy and further help my recovery. Mm. So uh, we began. I began studying these practices with him, and I was really, really surprised. Uh, I never anticipated that just what I what I said, just sitting and doing nothing but breathing, mm. would have such an impact on my uh, feelings and my psychophysiological state, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we began having uh, workshops and seeing this changing people that we knew. And eventually I began using it in my practice with my patients. And even in cases where I had had a patient in intensive psychotherapy or psychoanalysis for many years for severe trauma, mm -hmm. because I did rather deep therapy, there was often an aspect of the trauma that just couldn't be reached by talking, by verbal therapies. And uh, some of those patients I suggested begin doing breathing practices. And at some moment, suddenly, the whole trauma formation would open up and be able to be then worked on and changed and completely resolved, as though the mind could completely revert to a normal state. So. That really got my attention mm. and curiosity about we have there has to be some way to explain this in modern terms. Yeah. You know, this this isn't hysteria or suggestion or any of those things. So then we began really intensively trying to study the mechanisms, figure out how could breathing have an enormous impact on how the mind and emotions are functioning. Mm. And that's been a really exciting journey, I'd say the last twenty years, and we've had Quite a few, uh, we came up with a neurophysiological theory based on what we knew, and then further research uh, all the time, reading and looking and bringing bits and pieces of discoveries together uh, to finally form a theory that we felt made sense, and we've been testing it in studies. So it's, it's really been very exciting, yeah. quite a different direction it's for me than I anticipated. Very different, yeah, yeah, very different. Yeah. There's such, such different journeys that you've yeah. had. But for me, you know... I spent 40 years of my career, because I've been in clinical practice for practically 40 years, working one-on-one -on -one mostly, intensively, with people. Very rewarding to see how they can grow and change. But with these breathing practices, we can teach, could be a hundred or more people at one time, and they could then be trained to teach thousands of people. And so the scope of what we can achieve is so much greater. Uh, we decided at this point in our lives to really focus on getting this out into the world where it's needed. Mm. So you, you mentioned the mechanism. How can breath be healing when we're doing it all the time anyway? Is that a, is that a silly question? I don't know. Mm. Actually, it's a profound question. Oh, <laughs> so, well done. <laughs> uh, and actually, one of our 
lessons that we emphasize is that the brain listens to the lungs. Uh -huh. Okay, So breathing and emotion, in terms of neurologically, are very tightly connected. And the pathways are very rapid because the body is constantly sending messages to the brain because the brain needs to know what's going on everywhere inside the body. We're not conscious of this mm. unless something hurts and we feel that pain. That's a signal that's strong enough we'll notice. But all the time, messages are going from inside the body because there are sensory receptors everywhere, millions of them, yeah. okay? And within the respiratory system, there are millions of receptors inside the lungs and the airways of different kinds, stretch receptors, pressure, chemo receptors, all kinds of things. Because the brain needs to know from millisecond to millisecond what's happening with our breathing. Mm. Okay, And of all the information that comes from the body to the brain, all those billions of bits of information, the most important signals are coming from the lungs. Because supposing you stubbed your toe and it was throbbing with pain, and at the very same moment you were choking on a piece of your favorite food, whatever that might be. So you would have signals from the toe saying, ouch, I'm in pain. And you'd have signals from your respiratory system saying, we can't get any air in here. Mm. Which signal is your brain have to listen to? Mm. It has to listen to the respiratory because the entire mind has to focus on clearing your airway within three or four minutes mm. or you're a goner. Mm. So these are quite urgent. They get top priority. So the brain is constantly listening to the signals from the respiratory system, and they mean something. Mm. And what we discover is that when you change the pattern of your breathing, well, you're changing the pattern of those signals that are going to the brain. And certain patterns of breathing tell the brain that we're in danger. And certain patterns of breathing tell the brain we're safe. We can relax. We can calm down. So breath and emotion are very connected. Certain uh, emotions will be triggering certain breath patterns. Like when we're frightened, we breathe rapidly and fast. Mm -hmm. There's a connection. We're just working the system in reverse, where we're using the physical sim uh, signal that comes from breathing to affect how we're thinking and feeling. And it turns out that there are multiple pathways that this information from the respiratory system goes up certain nerves, particularly what are the vagus nerves, okay? And these are large nerves that go up and enter the brainstem. And then they branch pathways go to all the major regulatory centers and networks in the brain, mm. the emotion centers, the communication uh, within itself, internal communication systems. They go to the parts of the brain that involve thinking and judgment and decision making. So many, many aspects of our emotional and cognitive uh, processes are being impacted. And if we can figure out the code, in a sense, mm. what breathing pattern send the messages that that individual needs, then you're going to have an enormous impact through multiple mechanisms, through the entire functioning of the brain. So the in inhalation, exhalation, is, as a pattern, is almost like a code That's that right. we can use to sort of hack the, the system. Exactly. And you can change the rate or the rhythm of breathing, mm -hmm. you know, the speed with which you breathe. You can change the relationship between how long the inhale is in relation to the exhale. Mm -hmm. You can have different lengths of breathing. You can have little breath holds you put in there. Mm -hmm. You can breathe very gently or with force, or you can breathe against resistance. You can create resistance to the flow of air mm. many ways. Mm. Uh, some ways are by pursed lips. Yeah. Some ways by tightening the muscles in the throat. That's okay. how we create the sound for so would that be, ocean breath. Yeah, so I was going to say, so like um, people watching this might have tried yoga before exactly. and may have been told to do to do that kind of ocean sound breathing, exactly. ujjayi breath. So is that, what kind of effect would something like that have on, on the body? So when you tighten or slightly tighten 
those muscles, you're creating resistance to the flow of air, and that causes turbulence, which creates the sound that we hear. Okay. You can also create resistance by tightening your vocal cords when you speak. Mm -hmm. That's how we create the sound of talking mm -hmm. or singing or chanting. And that's another way of creating resistance. There are many different ways to mm -hmm. do it between the throat and the mouth and so forth. So when you do that, that has additional effects on stimulating the vagus nerves mm -hmm. and also the pressure that's created against the resistance also stimulates the vagus nerve. So there are many ways, uh, but the most easy, the, the easiest way to stimulate the vagal system is simply by slowing the breath rate down. Mm. And so we work with slower breath rates, and then we use these other techniques to enhance the effects that we wish to have. Okay, so when you're stimulating the, the vagal nerves, what, what does that do? Is, why is that good? So the vagal nerves are the main pathway of the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm. All of the automatic functions of our body are controlled by the autonomic nervous system, which has two main branches. Mm. The sympathetic branch of the nervous system comes into play when we have to mobilize, when there's, for example, danger, and that orchestrates the fight-flight reaction that we hear so much about. So when that comes on board, <clears throat> the heart speeds up, the breathing speeds up, blood flows to our muscles, so we're ready to fight or flee. Mm -hmm. And when the danger's passed, that system is supposed to quiet down, and then the parasympathetic system is supposed to come up and be more active, because that part of the system slows the heart, slows the respirations, restores energy reserves, quiets the system, and it is the anti-inflammatory action of the nervous system as well. But what's been discovered more recently in the last 15 or so years is that the vagus nerve isn't just having these calming effects on the body, it's also sending messages to the brain to tell the brain conditions are safe, now you can relax, be calm, and no longer be afraid. Mm. So that's the part of the system we're using to help people who may have had trauma or anxiety. When we activate the parasympathetic system, we are calming the mind. So when we use certain breathing techniques, particularly slow breathing, like what we call coherent breathing, mm -hmm. it has two effects. One, it quiets down the overactive sympathetic system, and it raises up the activity of the parasympathetic system to bring us into a kind of perfect balanced state. Does that help over time, or is it just while you're doing it that that's going to have a benefit? It definitely has many benefits, both immediately and over time, if you practice regularly on a daily basis, so say 20 minutes a day. A lot of people in our culture are subjected to multiple stressors. Uh, and our systems weren't really designed for that. So we're confronted with all kinds of little and big stressors all through the day. So our sympathetic system gets, keeps getting activated and activated to the point where it never really totally quiets down. And even in our sleep, in our dreams, uh, we're overactivated. So anything that is negative or threatening or scary or on the news can set this off. Mm. And we're in a state of sort of chronic overactivation, which is not good for us, mm. because when you're in that state, you have a lot of tension and overreactivity, and also it's not good for your health, mm. because when that system, that sympathetic system is churning on and on, it generates a huge number of free radicals, and those are the molecules that are causing all kinds of damage throughout our bodies and contributing to the progression of chronic diseases both heart disease, cardiovascular disease, the aging of the brain, these are all components of this system. So when we're able to, over time, practice these, we readjust the way our nervous systems are working in a natural way from the inside. And so we reduce that kind of long chronic damage. Mm. It also strengthens the parasympathetic system so that we're more stress resilient. 
So when something bad is going on, we can tolerate it better uh, without getting as worked up uh, as we might have otherwise been. Right, so it's improving your resilience because, Stress resilience because your parasympathetic nervous system is healthier and can can counteract that stress response. Exactly. Right, exactly. okay. And also it helps shuttle off the stress response system, the sympathetic branch, mm. because what happens is often once it gets turned on for people, it doesn't get turned off, mm. and then it gets kind of depleted. It's always over-functioning or predominant, mm. and it needs time to recharge, mm. and there needs to be a cycling between dealing with stress and recharging, mm. and that also then activates the social engagement systems, which means people also can have better relationships. Mm. So we're healing the sympathetic system as well by giving it a break. Right. 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 Wow. And so I, I've been asking the, the people who I've been interviewing um, if there's one thing we can, uh, somebody watching this can do today to improve their well-being tomorrow. Uh, what might it be? But I've got a good idea what you, <laughs> you're going to tell me it might be. Um, and I think it's probably going to be coherent breathing. And can you just tell me what, what that is and, and why people might be benefit? Yeah, uh, Stephen benefit Elliott uh, and his website is coherence.com first coined the term coherent breathing. Mm -hmm. But it was described in an ancient Chinese medical text 3,000 years ago as the breathing for longevity. Mm. Um, in the early 1990s, Paul Lehrer, a psychologist in New Jersey, did a study with Japanese researchers going to three traditional Zen monasteries outside of Tokyo. And they had the abbots rate the monks as advanced or not advanced, and they quickly realized the ones rated it as advanced had all been meditating for eight or more hours a day for 20 or more years. Wow. <laughs> and uh, what was interesting, when they measured many things that happened when they were meditating, was all the advanced monks immediately began doing what we are calling coherent breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, they had never been taught. It took many, many years of meditation, and it really facilitated, supported, or enhanced their meditation. And it opens a doorway to deeper meditation, too. Um, they came back and began studying normal people, making them in the laboratory breathe in all possible rhythms to see while they measured many systems of the brain and the body, what rhythm of breathing produced the most optimal effects. And they found it was breathing at about four and a half to six breaths per minute for the person of average height. For taller people, the breathing should be somewhat slower. Okay. For shorter people, especially children, it mm. needs to be a bit faster, depending on their age. Mm. At the same time, Dr. Luciano Bernardi in Milan was studying medical conditions that affect breathing, as well as high-altitude adaptation. And he began doing the same experiments as did the group in New Jersey. Completely separate. Completely separate. Right. And they discovered the same thing in their laboratory, oh. that everything they could measure became optimal in doing they they use the term resonant breathing. Okay. So why those two terms? Uh, because sometimes it's confusing mm. to people we teach. So ordinarily we have, let's say, to put it, I think of it in Japanese terms, because mm -hmm. I've been doing that since I was 12. We have a mind-body-spirit complex, and it's all integrated. And each of those systems has their rhythms. In fact, even within your brain, there's a certain hour of the day where you do algebra better. And there's a certain hour of the day where you do arithmetic better. Mm. And other things your brain or body does, you have strength at a peak around 5 or 6 p.m., for mm. example. Why these things are, it's presumably a product of evolution. But normally, your rhythms that determine the activity of all those different systems are very chaotic and incoherent. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And what they discovered when people began doing that breathing. So we like the rate of five breaths per minute. Dr. Bernardi in Italy used six breaths per minute because they were dealing with people with severe medical conditions mm. as well as having professional mountain climbers climb Everest yeah. and making them function better by learning uh, the breathing. Uh, but basically, they're very similar mm. in the effects on the body. Mm. We use five breaths per minute because it feels much more calming. 
uh, okay. to most people very quickly. So that's slower. I'm, I'm trying to it's work it out. It's a little out. slower. You mentioned right. algebra. That's not my strong point. So five, <laughs> five would be slower than six. Five, five, five yes. breaths per minute yeah, okay. is slower than six. It's yeah. about five breaths per minute is six seconds in, six seconds out, yeah. and the six breaths per minute is five seconds in, five so, seconds out. It feels subjectively different for most people. Okay. So everyone has a different feeling about whether it's fast right. or slow. For right. Them. But it's it's in the right zone. Okay. And what's interesting is when you're doing either of those breathings, mm. uh, there's a coherence that occurs in electrical activity and blood flow and numerous rhythms. And instead of all your rhythms being incoherent, they, be they become beautifully coherent. As in they're in rhythm with each other. They're in rhythm with so each your, other. So your blood and... It, it looks like sine waves. And you can show these amazing overlaps between different parts of the system, like your brain and your heart blood flow align. Normally, your your brain and your mind and your heart are not together. Mm. That's a, As in, a, my brain waves <laughs> are doing one thing and my pulse is doing something else. And right, right. Okay. So you're aligning with a basic what some neurophysiologists call isolate oscillator, kind of a clock, determining your blood pressure and your arterial pressure wave. That's kind of the foundation of your whole system. And you're aligning with that natural deep rhythm within your body. And then these things happen. And Bernardi's group is interested in how it wasn't just one or two systems. It was There was a resonance. That is, all these systems were coherent, but they were coherent together across multiple systems. And we think that must have to do with the fact that both labs found whatever they could measure. Yeah it became optimal after yeah. not that long a time breathing and would last for quite a while afterwards. So I stop breathing, but still my body is in rhythm with it's itself. It stays in rhythm. So yeah. my breath, so my, so you're using your breath almost like the orchestra conductor. Exactly. And then everything else gets in line. Right. And what, how does that affect me? Obviously I can imagine there's a mental right. effect of calming from what we've been talking about, but what, what's the, is there any other physiological effects of that? Well, as an analogy for me, it's like listening to an, different instrument sections in an orchestra warming up before a performance. Mm -hmm. And then when they play together, it's very beautiful. Mm. So it means you can solve more complex problems more quickly and creatively. Mm -hmm. You can relate to other people with cooperativeness instead of conflict or competition mm. overpowering. Mm. I'm not saying competition's bad, mm. but these days we need to cooperate. We do, I think compared to when I was younger, we're doing much more multidisciplinary things, whatever we're doing. Mm. And we need to put all of our knowledge together and work in teams to really move forward in our evolution as a species. Yeah. Uh, well, just as an example, some very recent studies were done uh, using electrodes and recording uh, brain waves mm -hmm. and it was found that if you use certain slower breathing rhythms you could actually what they call entrain or make coherent the brain waves so the brain waves would adapt to that rhythm that was set by the breathing and that would spread to larger and larger areas of the brain. So normally, if you look at, say, a 17-lead electroencephalogram, you see a bunch of what looks like random squiggly lines. Mm. But what happens when you're doing this breathing is those squiggles begin to line up and the curves begin to become synchronized and larger areas of the brain. And so it spreads. Larger areas of the brain are literally synchronized electronically through these brain waves and when you do that of course what happens one thing we know long-term synchrony does is the areas of the brain are able to function together better over greater distances okay so it does alter how the brain is working and so that's the the feeling of synchrony and the everything coming into alignment uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about HRV as well, which you mentioned in your book. Mm -hmm. So um, what is what is HRV? Well, well, we'll both talk about that. HRV really means heart rate variability, and that means the rate at which the heartbeat changes. And uh, when people wanted to understand what the vagal system was doing mm. to enhance parasympathetic function and all the things we've talked about, 
In the beginning, they studied something called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is simply that when a healthy person, especially a child, a baby, breathes in, their heartbeat speeds up, and when they breathe out, it slows down. Mm -hmm. And what call, what's called the vagal break slows down the heart rate as you breathe out. So breathing in is related to your stress response system, your sympathetic branch of the autonomic system. When you breathe out, it's primarily related to the parasympathetic branch. So you can assess kind of the tone or activity of the vagal system, seeing what the rate of increase is and what the rate of decrease is. But it's very much affected by talking, and it's a, it's a very dirty measure. But it okay. was used for many studies, mm -hmm. and it was found that uh, in a lot of psychiatric and medical conditions, it was disturbed in different ways. So that there would be a measurable difference in somebody with a specific condition to their the very their their heart's ability to speed up and slow down in response yes. to yes. how their body's moving or changing. And, yes, okay. but because it was crude, people wanted to develop a better measure for scientific research, and heart rate variability was what came out of that. So mm -hmm. they found when they took a cardiogram or had some measure of the to beat pattern of the heart electrical activity, mm. if you did a Fourier transform, which is, you might say, advanced calculus, mm. you could have a certain frequency of waves representing the tone or activity of the vagal parasympathetic system mm -hmm. and waves representing the sympathetic system. Okay. Uh, it is not a perfect measure, but it's a lot better. Mm -hmm. So what it really showed was doing this kind of breathing really enhances much better flexibility of the system. And that's interesting. Of the heart system. Of the heart system, right, okay. which kind of is the core of our being, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And in the Tao Te Ching, which was written probably 3,000 or more years ago, uh, there's a verse on breathing, and it starts out by saying the purpose of the breathing practices is to induce the tenderness of a newborn baby. And that's what it does. And so tenderness as in almost like flexibility. Flexibility, yeah. yeah. So, for example, having a higher heart rate variability is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And it has been correlated that the higher your heart rate variability is correlated with health and longevity. And this has been demonstrated. So if I do this, I'll live longer. Absolutely. Really? And healthier. Wow. And happier. <laughs> and, and my brain waves will synchronize. <laughs> I'll promise. But, I'll be good at but, algebra finally, yeah. by the sounds of it. But many different uh, studies have been done looking at heart rate variability now. Mm -hmm. And it's been correlated with some very interesting things. For example, even in children, children who have low heart rate variability tend to be more depressed and withdrawn. Also, uh, it's been associated with behavioral problems and later with problems that lead to incarceration. Children who have higher heart rate variability respond better to their environment. Mm. And in boys, it's been found that a higher heart rate variability correlates with a greater empathic ability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because one of the more recent discoveries and uh, a lot of this would be attributed to uh, Dr. Stephen Porges. Yes. Uh, he discovered that the vagal system has a tremendous input to what is called the social engagement system, which is the, the part of our ner nervous system that enables us to have human relationships, to be close to others, mm -hmm. to be empathic, to cooperate, and to bond. That's all part of this special system. Uh, and so we can use these practices to activate those pro-social functions. We know that when people experience too much trauma and adversity, mm -hmm. especially in childhood, yeah. uh, adverse events in childhood, that what happens is instead of being socially engaged, you get a lot of defensive reactions. Mm -hmm. uh, anger, aggression, or withdrawal and fear, those sorts of things. And so we can use this breathing to activate the social, positive social engagement system, reduce the defensive reactions, and enable the individual to engage in a more positive way socially, to feel close, to feel connected rather than alienated. And this is all from coherent breathing? 
Coherent breathing activates those systems. Okay. Activates the social engagement system. So it, it sounds like this. It's not just physical health, but also okay. mental health and actually and social health. So, so social in yeah. terms of actually improving your relationships as right. well as your mental health. Um, well, I'm definitely sold. <laughs> um, I'd love to be able to try some today, if that's all right. Sure. Um, but first, I'd like to just quickly talk about your where you're using this in in, in the real world. Um, I know because you mentioned in your book you're uh, going to d disaster relief zones and using this as a first response for people mm -hmm. experiencing trauma. Um, would you mind telling me a, a bit about how that works and what kind of effects you've seen? Well, uh, one of the first things I realized after 9-11 was that the one healer, one client model doesn't work alone. That we need to move medically, socially, to work with large groups to help people change how they feel, change their behavior mm. in a more positive way. Mm. And that our medical system hasn't yet really appreciated that. I think the National Health Service in England is moving towards social prescribing and engaging the power of a group to change mm. people's behavior. Mm. But we're talking about not, not just doing that, but changing their internal software to work in a better way mm. to enable them to achieve their goals much better. And so we were working with 9-11 responders and also I had traveled with a famous breathing teacher in India and had my Japanese teacher and a Chi several Chinese Qigong masters and seeing them work with really large groups of people. Mm. Uh, and, and, I and I had also seen it in the Native American tradition with healing, working with groups of people and in a very different way than Western medicine yeah. has and, been. And do you think just working in a group alone is beneficial? I think the group is so powerful and there's interesting data, just having people do the same kind of movements together in a group, mm. synchronized movement, mm. has a really good effect. Yeah. Uh, so we started working with 9-11 responders and uh, getting really good results, helping people recover better. And the, that moved on to working with other people because we have a traumatized world. Uh, at this point. Uh, so many of the people who train with us are yoga therapists, but many are social workers. Mm -hmm. And there are people of many different professions, but those are the two largest groups. And one social worker who also uh, had a family foundation for philanthropy uh, quickly learned to teach it because we also felt that this could be, the breathing is so powerful. Mm -hmm. You can teach the core of it in a very short time. And it has such quickly, profoundly beneficial effects. Uh, but also the way I was taught doing martial arts and other movement arts from Asia mm. uh, is first the movement and then movement with mindful conscious breathing, then focusing on the breathing and then training your attention, which is meditation. Okay, so when you've got a group, you'll get them to move, then move in time with their breathing and right. then just be breathing just and, be breathing and focusing on the and in, what's inside I guess. right so, right what, what's the reasoning behind that, that well it's interesting i think they somehow discovered it naturally in asia i don't think they had an a priori idea about that, that it was going to be that way they mm. just got the best results mm. that way and is that so is that what yoga mm. is it yoga follow similar model? Uh, some styles of yoga yeah. interestingly after we had developed our program because it, i we partly looked for practices that appear in different parts of the world mm -hmm. separated by hundreds or thousands of miles usually mm -hmm. often hundreds of years apart which have often been kept secret and yet they overlap so strongly it, they couldn't have talked to each other. Mm, we know that. Mm. Uh, but it's the same thing. And, and for me, teaching around the world in different cultures, people go, that's what we do. And I'd say, that's what they found in China and Russia and Japan mm. and Native Americans. <laughs> yeah. So oh, the natural movement and the natural connection to our breath, because the breath is the connection from the outside world mm -hmm. to our inner world. Mm -hmm. And people are so caught up in the outer world. And is the stuff out there going to make me feel good or bad? Mm -hmm. And trying to deal with that. 
and project into the future. Mm -hmm. And really you need to be anchored in your inner self all the time, mm -hmm. especially when there are so many conflicting demands and things are changing so fast, it's easy to get distracted and you need to be really centered. So when we, when we discovered that this was so helpful to what we call in the New York area, the 9-11 community, mm -hmm. first responders, people who escaped from the towers, area residents, ground zero workers, uh, people had all different kinds of exposures, families mm -hmm. who were bereaved, so many different groups many of whom had attended clinics and had all kinds of medical treatments, when they came began telling us so many physical and psychological improvements. We realized that there had be there there was a tremendous potential here for anyone subjected to a mass disaster. Mm -hmm. And we kind of got the idea of, well, if we wanted to design a program specifically for those situations, what would it look like? And we took into consideration those conditions. So our goal was to design a program, which we now call Breath, Body, Mind, which would be able to be delivered to large populations by a small number of providers. Mm -hmm. It would be very simple to teach and learn. It would have an immediate beneficial effect as well as long-term effects. Mm -hmm. It would be safe for everyone regardless of their physical or emotional state. Because in the course of studying all these different practices, we found that some breathing practices are not safe for everyone, that vulnerable individuals can have bad reactions, for example, to very rapid or forceful breathing. Mm. So we eliminated all of those from our program, and we only kept those that we felt were really going to be safe okay. for most people. Or for people who have medical illnesses, maybe they would require a little adaptation or respiratory problems or whatever, but basically quite safe, effective, require no equipment, no electricity, be very low in cost, and you could rapidly train the local folks themselves to become teachers because when the NGOs leave a disaster zone, the trauma goes on and on for years and generations, mm -hmm. as we know very well. So in order to make it truly sustainable, and we've been very fortunate to have several opportunities to do this and to see it work in action. One example would be in South Sudan, where uh, Dr. Brown has been a couple of times now uh, teaching local uh, survivors how to do the practices. Uh, people, particularly large groups of women and often with children, who are being brought back. So. Now that they're being liberated and brought home again, of course, they've had horrific traumas. So the philanthropist that Dr. Brown mentioned began teaching breath, body, mind practices, mm -hmm. finding that even these severely traumatized people were responding. And so when a large group was about to be brought over, she brought Dr. Brown there to teach them as a group. And then several of the women, 17 of the women volunteered to become the breath, body, mind teachers. And for the past seven years now, they've been going to the local villages and orphanages teaching. And he went then back to the Juba Medical Center and trained their mental health staff because they need interventions that they can do countrywide, 12 million traumatized people and hardly any healthcare providers. We also have, we, co we basically collaborate with nonprofit organizations Another example would be Global Grassroots. They've brought breath, body, mind practices to Uganda, Rwanda, and other countries, and their teachers have now touched thousands and thousands of lives. Mm. So it's very exciting, it's very rewarding. Uh, we've also worked with refugees, for example, Middle East refugees in Berlin shelters, and everyone responds. Nobody says, doesn't want to do this. It comes very easily to them. Most recently, we've been working with a small nonprofit called No Limit Generation, mm -hmm. and their website is nolimitgen.org. -E okay. If you have a chance to view it, it's amazing. What they're doing is uh, creating schools to help the Rohingya refugee children. Uh, there are about 300,000 of these very traumatized children driven out of Myanmar by the genocide 
now living in refugee camps in Bangladesh, suffering terribly. And they wanted to build little schools to give them some few hours of normalcy to their day. Mm -hmm. And they contacted us and asked if we could teach them some of the practices that we use for children, because we've also been developing these programs for at-risk children. And of course, they work now very well in refugee children as well. So by Skype, because of course they were in Bangladesh and we were here, yeah. we trained them in the evening by Skype. Within a few weeks, their teachers began teaching these to the children and seeing the children respond. You know, children who had been withdrawn and non-communicative, coming out of their shell, smiling, laughing. Uh, so now they're teaching this, making this available to NGOs uh, that are working there. Mm, through um, this website. Through this website, but also uh, they their workers are going and meeting with leaders of the various NGOs mm. to show them videos which they've now made yeah. of the practices. And the effects. And, and they get excited and they want it for their NGO workers and, of course, the thousands of children under their care. So they now have a global uh, open access website where anyone can go and view these videos that teach about child trauma, child mm. stress, mm. and that uh, show the actual techniques, show us teaching children how to do these various practices that help them mm. overcome the anxiety, uh, overcome the fear, teach them how to go to sleep at night because they have very difficult uh, problems with sleep yeah. and help them deal with their feelings of anger and aggression mm -hmm. uh, so that they don't act out mm. uh, on those feelings. Mm. Very helpful for them to help them focus their minds so they can learn better in school. That's incredible. So it's not only is it uh, kind of something you can teach to huge groups of people, it's something you can easily teach to teachers exactly. and it transcends not only age because you're doing it with children and adults but also language because it's just breathing. Right, it's just movement and breathing. Simon says, do what I do. And with just a little bit of language, you can convey that. So, I mean, we've just discussed how incredible this sounds, but I'd really like to have a go, if that's okay. Is that something we can do? Absolutely. What, what do I need to be able to do this? As long as you have a pair of lungs. Okay. And you can follow, no problem. So what we're gonna be doing is, pacing our breathing mm -hmm. um, and it's really nice to start with a little movement with the breathing so I'll okay. use my voice to pace us and okay. then we'll switch to using two bells chiming and it's more calming to breathe in and out through the nose and we'll do that okay. and if someone listening knows ocean breath uh, or in India the Sanskrit term is ujjayi breathing they mm -hmm. can certainly use that too okay so let's do a Qigong movement called Painting the Waterfall as we do it. So just imitate what I do. So breathe in, two, three, four, and breathing out, two, three, four. Breathing in, two, three, four. Breathing out, two, three, four. Breathing in. Two, three, four, breathing out. Two, three, four, breathing in. Two, three, four, breathing out. Two, three, four. And let's rest our hands a moment. And going inside, you may want to close your eyes or close them part way. Feel any changes in your fingers and hands, in your mind, in the quality of your breath. And now I'm going to pace us using two bells chiming, and one will be a high tone, one will be a low tone. We're going to breathe in together on the high tone and out on the low tone for a short time just to experience it. And we may use an additional modification of the breathing that is found a little bit in India, more in China, and to a very significant degree in Siberia and Russia and some other cultures. We call it moving the breath, and we use our imagination to move the breath and our awareness within our body.
That's the low tone. And that's the high tone. Breathing in effortlessly, continuously. Breathing out effortlessly, continuously. So breathing in, our stomach gets bigger. And breathing out, the stomach gets smaller. First, it feels hard to go the length of a chime, breathing all the way in or out. You can pause your breath for a second. We come to do this with a lot of accumulated stress, and it lets go quickly. Breath in. that change the quality of your breathing. of your body relax. Your mind 
mind and breath are just moving energy naturally. to go into whatever rhythm it wants to be in. Observe the sensations in your body. Can you feel more of a space between your thoughts? Can you feel more space inside your feelings? What rhythm does your breath want to be in? And what are its qualities? And just imagine the breath, however slowly and gently it's moving inside you, filling every cell of your body with energy, which it does. And as the breath leaves your body, you're filled with empty space. Stay with that experience for a couple of breaths. And when you're ready, you can stretch your body, your arms and legs. And observe how the breathing carries over into whatever you're doing in your life. <laughs> and just naturally let your eyes open. Well, I feel completely different inside after mm -hmm. doing that. I can I could feel my pulse mm -hmm. in my fingertips. Yes. And my body felt bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's. And what do you notice about your mind and your thoughts? Um, changed. Very calm. Very calm. Uh, there was a point where I, I felt bad that you were having to speak, so you couldn't be experiencing what I was experiencing. No, I'm still experiencing this. Okay. <laughs> So that suggests yeah. my empathy is working. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's wow. all that chatter, all that noise. Just yeah. smooth. Yeah. It's wonderful, especially for people like me who tend to worry about things. Mm. Just quiet. It's lovely. And then one of the nice things, one of the many nice things about the coherent breathing is it allows you to function in meditation in daily life with kind of an optimal state of energy and relaxation. Mm. And traditionally, it was taught that you might just do yoga movement postures for years and then begin to learn slow breathing and really calm your brain down, really mm. slow everything down. Mm. But then you're so kind of relaxed 
it's hard to meet your daily life with energy and activity and problem yeah. solving. And you don't just want to be sitting there in meditation with your eyes closed all the time. You want to be able to carry that state of mind over to your everyday life, whatever you're doing. Mm. And so for me, that was part of it, having done a lot of meditation and breathing and martial arts, where you have to learn to be meditative when mm. you're doing active mm. things, is to help people learn to take it into their daily life so that it transforms their lives. Mm. Well, I feel like I could go and do a traditional sort of a passionate meditation now and mm -hmm. get a lot more out of it because I'm my internal feelings are so alive right, right. now. Exactly. And is, is that, you know, you were mentioning earlier that you're triggering the vagus nerve, I think you said. Mm -hmm. it, is mm -hmm. that what's happening? Is that what I'm feeling now? My, yes. Yes. my vagus nerve is working more mm -hmm. yeah. so I right. can feel what's happening inside more. Yeah. So we're, we could say you're in a parasympathetic state. Mm. Kind of I like it. Yeah, parasympathetic <laughs> state. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, one of the things that we do uh, we recommend that people do 20 minutes a day, mm -hmm. which seems to be the therapeutic dose, if okay. you will, for most people. I mean, if, if you have a lot of trauma or a panic disorder or something like that, then you might need twice a day. But 20 minutes, continuous, focused, paying attention, not watching the television <laughs> while yes, you're doing yeah. it, but really focused, that's going to go deep into the nervous system and help to bring about these changes and then after a while when you've done that for some weeks then to begin doing it with eyes open in addition at home like you're puttering around preparing dinner or doing the laundry mm -hmm. learn to put on the pacing chime track mm -hmm. and do it with your eyes open and then you can do it anywhere anytime yeah. any tense situation at work or whatever yeah. And nobody knows you're doing it. It's totally private because mm. everybody's tearing their hair out and you're just sitting there breathing, you mm. know, whatever else is going on. So it becomes something you can find little moments in the day. Yeah, and almost make Humanity. it a reflex to, exactly. to, to do that. Whenever there's stress, okay. you have a tool to calm your system and it will also focus the mind. That's one of the things why coherent breathing is not just breathing at, say, five breaths per minute, mm. but it's also breathing with an in equal length of inhale and exhale mm -hmm. because the inhale is more sympathetic and the exhale is more parasympathetic. And we attain this sweet spot mm. where you have both calmness but also alertness. Mm -hmm. So you're not just meditative and la-la. Mm -hmm. You are relaxed and your brain is functioning quite well yeah, yeah. for tasks. Yeah. Yeah. So so I'll, I'll be feeling effects of having done that now for, for the rest of the day, will I, in terms of... Well, it depends. Maybe for a few hours initially, uh, yeah. you know. But in the afternoon, if you're feeling your stress you know is coming back, you could just get in a five-minute yeah. practice and kind of bring yourself back into your parasympathetic state mm. whenever you feel the need to. Oh, amazing. And so it sounds like a, an obvious question, but, you know, I, I've just experienced that and I can feel the difference. And from what you're saying, there's a lot of science behind what's happening on the inside. Why don't people know about this? Shouldn't everyone know about this? <laughs> we hope so. Okay. We hope so. You know, we, we don't, have a PR firm, mm. you know, we're not like a pharmaceutical company that has an army of salesmen, you yeah, know, to flood yeah. the world with information. Mm -hmm. And breathing is free. Yeah. You know, everybody can do it. So we're not going to make billions like the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the word is getting out. Okay. Uh, we are writing about it, speaking about it, and our teachers are bringing it to many places mm. now. We're having our first uh, teacher training, Breath, Body, Mind teacher training, at the Minded Institute with Heather Mason mm -hmm. this very week. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been in Ireland at Belfast with Action Trauma, which just came from there. So we're trying to develop teachers in different countries mm -hmm. who themselves will spread the word mm. uh, and do good work. And, and so, that's how it's getting out. And so in terms of the public, there's, there's, there's this trickle-down thing where it's going to hopefully expand. Um, what's the reaction in the, the re your medical colleagues to, to this kind of research? Is it, is, are people warming to it? I, I'd say the younger doctors are very interested. Okay. I mean, in a sense, what we're saying is this saves money. 
Mm. And mm. one of my concerns about American medicine, mm. which I know better than other countries, is that in the last 30 years, things have gone to try to find more and more expensive treatments for mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And that's partly to keep medical schools going and research going, and I understand that. But my feeling is people are feeling so helpless and angry now. Mm. People need to be empowered and to take responsibility for kind of the foundation of their being. And that's your nervous system. Yeah. And the breathing allows you to change mm. that. Uh, so, you know, there are some older doctors who are shocked by how much research there is on this now. We haven't talked about all the research no. by any means. Mm. And many different groups in different parts of the world are now more excited about doing research and understanding what it tells us about the foundation of our nervous system and our relation to the environment. So we're going to see a lot more research. But the young doctors, I think, are really excited. And also, they're very stressed. Mm. So they want tools for themselves. Mm. So yeah, I think you've actually mentioned uh, that students are using this to prepare for exams. Well, yes, uh, I see a lot of university students in my practice. So medical students. Uh, also uh, medical uh, students, yeah. but yeah. high school students as well yeah, are yeah. under so much stress and pressure with these examinations. Yeah. So we teach them to do their coherent breathing on their way to take their test. Yeah. Continue while they're sitting there and the pencils and papers are being passed out. And it will keep them from getting panicky, from having their minds go blank. Yeah, yeah. And they can even do it during their tests to keep themselves calm and at the same time sharp and mm, focused. So mm. it's very helpful for students and also for artistic performance, for uh, people who have anxiety about performing on stage, whether it's a child giving a recital mm -hmm. or uh, an advanced medical student, mm. uh, say in New York. Uh, we have some very um, fine teachers there uh, at Juilliard who teach their music students to do this, not only when they practice their instrument because it enhances flow, mm. but when they have to perform in competition and their scores go way up. Wow. So, uh, and, and then again, of course, for sports, we haven't even talked much about the fact that this type of breathing enhances the ability of the body to extract oxygen with each breath and increases the capacity for absorbing oxygen while expending the least amount of energy. Mm. So over time, it will enhance athletic performance, which is a selling point for boys, as yes, <laughs> of yeah, course, yeah. Uh, uh, and young men as well. And we also do a lot of work for veterans and uh, active duty military. We've been working with certain, uh, we've done programs for the Army, Navy, and the Marines at this point mm. uh, to help them uh, overcome the effects of uh, physical and emotional trauma uh, due to their military service, mm -hmm. and also for the caregivers. Mm. Uh, we're training them in how to provide the practices within their service units. Incredible. And also working with a lot of children in schools, both grade schools and high schools mm. uh, because the children, at least in America, are extremely stressed. Yeah. 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 Um, so we've got through so much today, but as you say, there seems to be so much more we've not got into right at the end. Um, how can people find out more if uh, people watching this have, have got an interest? Well, we'd in invite everyone to visit our website, which is breath-body-mind dot com, mm -hmm. breathbodymind.com, and there uh, on the various pages uh, people can read about the different programs. We also have video clips demonstrating a lot of the practices. Um, we have interviews, uh, resources for information, and we have on our workshop page uh, a, a list of all of our upcoming programs. Um, also, by geographic location, we have on our teachers page lists of Breath, Body, Mind teachers in the various countries and geographic areas, and a description of our teacher training program. Mm. So, uh, if anyone's interested in that, we also have a free newsletter you can sign up for, and people can contact us through the website uh, if they have a particular question, or they're interested in training, or developing a program for their area. 
uh, we'd be happy to respond to that as well. Amazing. And, so, and are they can they have a go on those chimes on the on the website? Uh, mm. What we have is uh, for that um, we have a publication called The Healing Power of the Breath. Mm -hmm. And in this book, the first half of the book actually teaches a lot of the practices. Yeah. And it has a CD with it uh, so that you can hear Dr. Brown leading the practices. It's also available on an ebook for people who don't have a CD player. And the second half of the book describes how to use it for different aspects of life, mm -hmm. uh, depending on where you want to focus. So that's called The Healing Power of the Breath. Mm -hmm. And on our website, we describe each of our books. Uh, you can look them up, you can order them on Amazon or whatever. Um, so those are some of the available. Excellent, uh, there's loads there. And there's if loads. people want to get just the pure two bells track mm -hmm. in a long way, they can go to coherence.com okay. and it's on iTunes and other, other sites as it's, well. It's out there yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Okay. But we hope, if possible, that people will take a workshop because uh, in the workshops, we have an opportunity to teach so much more mm -hmm. and also to observe how the person is breathing mm. and be sure that they're optimizing okay. the way because you could give the same instructions to 100 people. They do it 100 different ways. Yeah. And there are many ways. So, uh, But uh, we invite people to come and experience it for yeah, themselves. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, guys, thank you so much for, for joining me. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful to have you here. Lovely being here. Thank you. Thank you. So it's about 20 minutes since I did that coherent breathing that Dr. Brown was leading, and I'm still feeling uh, the effects. Um, so if you, if you want to have a go at that yourself, I really recommend finding those chimes uh, on one of the websites that they talked about. I'll leave a link in the description. Um, and if you're a yoga teacher or a Qigong teacher or a yoga therapist or a psychologist or a doctor watching this, um, then I strongly recommend reading their book, The Healing Power of the Breath. It's really accessible um, and to the point, and there's, there's so many different ways that the breath can change your physiology, and they go into loads of detail, not only about how to do it, but also the evidence behind uh, what's happening. Um, next time, I'll be interviewing Dr. Danny Penman, uh, the author of Mindfulness for Creativity. Um, so, yeah, hit subscribe if that sounds interesting to you. Thanks for watching. Thank you.